Hello, well, this I, is I Keith Parson, Executive Director of the IoT M2M Council, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to track two within our Consumer IoT Summit presented by the IMC. Hope everyone joining us is staying safe and well in these interesting times. Uh, the topic for this track is IoT sustainability uh, uh, for consumer applications. But first, I'm going to give a few instructions about your interface, as well as say a few words about the IMC and the Consumer Electronics Show coming up in January in Las Vegas, of course. Uh, you can see a full schedule for this and other conference tracks in the resources section of your interface. I'll be uh, introducing our moderator for today's conference track, ben, my good friend Benson Chan from Strategy of Things Group, in just a moment, but uh, first we need to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets that you can use. All of the widgets are resizable and movable. So feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presenter. If your slides are delayed, uh, pushing F5 on your keyboard will refresh the page. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presenter. Uh, if you have any questions during the webcast, uh, please note you can submit them at any time through the Q&A widget. The presenters may answer the questions at the end of each session, but please feel free to ask questions at any time. Uh, rest assured, we will have a record of your question tied to your registration, and we will be able to answer those questions offline if we don't get to them during the live presentation. Now, just a quick word about the IMC uh, before I move on to our subject. Um, uh, the IoT MTEM Council is the largest professional organization dedicated to the IoT sector comprised of 25,000 individual enterprise users, product makers and OEMs, and apps developers that deploy IoT technology. We call them our adopter members and they join the IMC for access to our content, which includes the most extensive online library, online library of use cases, white papers and eBooks, our on-demand events, uh, uh, template RFPs and other sourcing guidelines, uh, and uh, uh, just a host of good content. Important to note that they come to us from 27 different vertical markets of application. Everything from automotive manufacturing to energy and utilities, to medical devices, to retail point of sale. We're also based all over the globe. Only 30% of our adopter members are from North America. Uh, though all of our content is in English, the rest are fairly evenly dispersed around the, uh, on every continent. Uh, the IMC Board of Governors is comprised of about 35 companies that provide IoT solutions. We call them sustainer member companies, and they join the IMC for exclusive access to our community for purposes of thought leadership, lead generation, promotion, and research. Our mission at the IMC is to accelerate the adoption of IoT technology for the public good by bringing our adopters and our sustainers together. And we look at today's conference track on sustainability as exactly in keeping with that mission. Uh, this conference is also, uh, this conf online conference session is also being supported by uh, the Consumer Technology Association and the Consumer Electronics Show. Everybody knows CES, right? What you may not know is that CES has become the largest IoT event in the world as far as we're concerned. It's long been known as an event for technology innovation in crucial IoT sectors like automotive, health and wellness, and smart homes. But more recently, it's become a major gathering of the year for IoT infrastructure smart cities, AI and machine learning, and robotics. I like to think IMC's partnership with the CTA has something to do with that. We'll be organizing IoT Week at CES, where we'll be working with the show to produce conference programming, recording interviews and panels on the show floor, hosting networking and press events, and of course, organizing the IoT Infrastructure Pavilion in the North Hall of the LVCC. With that, I'd like to introduce Benson Chan of Strategy of Things Group. Benson is not just a founder of Strategy of Things Group, but he's also the chairman of the NIST IoT Advisory Board. The National Institute of Standards and Technology is the group within the Department of Commerce that is ostensibly tasked with recommending how the U.S. government will be spending all those billions on infrastructure as it regards IoT technology. Benson, welcome. Good morning. 
Okay, thank you, Keith, for that introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good day to our audience from uh, all over the world. Uh, today, our topic is uh, IoT brings uh, sustainability to public grids. And I'll just read the abstract. Uh, so, innovative IoT technology is enabling businesses and communities to execute on a variety of sustainability initiatives. For example, uh, integrating IoT into the home and community solar energy systems helps those systems manage uh, more effectively and stabilize the local grid. Uh, IoT sensors can help uh, conserve water use, like for example, in the irrigation systems or in farming systems, uh, and manage sewer and waste systems more efficiently. Uh, air quality networks uh, for in many of the cities that we live in right, help monitor and mitigate public health risk, enhance traffic planning, and encourage carpooling. So in this uh, session, we'll explore other ways that IoT is making sustainability initiatives more effective. And we have four great panelists uh, here today. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll start with uh, introductions. I'll introduce myself uh, a little bit more and we'll share a couple of slides and each of our panelists will introduce themselves, their company and I'll share a few slides. So that's about 15 minutes. Uh, and then from there, we'll spend the next 25 minutes um, just answering questions and then i think at the end we have about 10 minutes for q a so please uh, as keith mentioned uh, earlier uh, please uh, if you have any questions please submit them through the uh, chat box uh, here so uh, with that uh, let's just go into introductions okay so my name is uh, again my name is benson chen i'm the uh, coo and co-founder of strategy of things uh, you know, feel free to connect with me uh, uh, by linkedin or on my email. Uh, um, so, uh, so as strategy of things, we're an innovation company. Uh, we help uh, cities, communities, and businesses become much more responsive, resilient, and smarter. We do this through science, strategy, and technology, uh, emerging technologies. We offer four levels of services, uh, strategy and planning, uh, innovation project and execution. So, for example, we built San Mateo County's uh, smart city strategy, smart county strategy. We built and ran and operated their innovation lab. Uh, and then when those uh, pilot projects go to scale, right, we help them with scaling those projects. So some of the projects, uh, pilot projects that we've done in the lab, they're now uh, about three or four of them have gone, uh, have gone uh, full, full deployment mode. We're building out a smart corridor uh, it's a $25 million smart corridor out in San Mateo County. So some of the projects, the IoT projects that we've done there uh, as pilots are now going into a scaling mode. And then finally, where we do innovation research, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so Keith mentioned the National Institute of Stance and Technology. Uh, so about three years ago, we were awarded a federal grant to look at IoT technology infrastructure. Uh, where the gaps are, but where industry isn't doing that the federal government should be doing. So, for example, uh, you know, uh, the things that their industry isn't doing now, and maybe the, there isn't the resources or the research in it. So, the federal government is looking at identifying those areas that they can step in and uh, do that research either through themselves, through the national labs, or through university grants or through industry grants. Um, and then uh, you know, three, four, five years from now, when some of the research is done, transfer that technology into the industry so they can continue the acceleration and adoption of IoT uh, development. We looked across 10 industries, one of them being the energy uh, uh, sector. Uh, and you know, these uh, industries that we're looking at, uh, this, we believe that's where IoT has a strategic impact, uh, but they're also vital to the national and economic security of the United States. Uh, so, as part of the research, uh, we looked at the energy, uh, renewable energy is one of the hottest areas for IoT uh, right now. Uh, so in the United States, about 21, 22% of the energy that's from the energy sources uh, before it converted to, uh, to electricity is from uh, renewable sources, hydropower for water, you know, water, water power, uh, re, uh, geothermal, uh, solar and wind. Right? Uh, solar and wind are uh, two of the fastest growing areas uh, for renewable energy. So that's a lot of uh, a pretty big area of opportunity. But in terms of electricity generation, right, anywhere from uh, generation, transmission, distribution, and consumption, right, uh, those are opportunities for IoT. 
Uh, in fact, in the consumption area, I think Alex, you know, you'll talk about that. That's one of the hottest areas for re renewable energy. Uh, and that's one of the hottest areas for IoT. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over. I'll pause here and I'll turn it over to you, Alex, uh, to introduce yourself and your company. Yes, thank you, Benson. And hello, everybody. It is uh, great to be here today. My name is Alex Bajanov. I'm the founder and president of Lumen. Um, at Lumen, we believe that the future of the grid will look like um, a combination of multiple microgrids. Every building in the future will be its own microgrid. While still being connected to the larger grid, every building will be doing the real-time act of balancing supply and demand of uh, power, and where supply can be coming from the broader grid or can be coming from on-site uh, distributed energy resources, such as solar or energy storage or bi-directionally capable electric vehicle that's plugged in, uh, you know, uh, in your garage. And then naturally um, uh, understanding and managing where that power is flowing to, which appliances and uh, which use cases in your house uh, or any building, really commercial or industrial. And we also believe that the, these microgrids or buildings will be interacting with each other in coming together to form certain pools or what today is known as virtual power plants to provide services to the broader grid. And really uh, what we're seeing right now is in, uh, Benson, I don't know how many slides you have, but if you have several, you can probably move, uh, uh, switch, switch further. Uh, okay. What we're seeing right now is of course, the rapid need for decarbonization. Um, really the answer to, the, to this challenge, the, the global challenge today is uh, we need to electrify um, uh, really you know everything in in you know whether it's transportation you know electric vehicles whether it's end use appliances heating uh, water heating space heating and so on and unfortunately our grid today is not ready to take on all this new massive load that's coming its way in in really the grid has to develop the ability to manage the edge of the grid. So something that's traditionally called behind the meter territory, which is really inside your house, inside your building, all these and appliances, all these behind the meter solar and storage systems. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, that, that's, that's, that's the big problem. The grid is not ready to grow quick enough to adopt all these new um, uh, electrified use cases and it doesn't have the capabilities today to manage the grid edge. And that's where, you know, with Lumen, we come with a solution for a distributed energy management platform. And Benson, you can uh, switch further. Uh, we uh, develop and deploy, um, oh, that's not us. Um, okay, so I guess I only have two slides. Uh, we develop and deploy a Lumen energy management platform that has both hardware and software component. The hardware component is something that we call a uh, distributed smart panel, which uh, goes into your house, attaches to your existing circuit breaker panel in home wiring, and enables monitoring and control of individual circuits in your home, as well as uh, uh, interconnects with your home solar, home battery, and enables you to participate in broader grid programs, such as demand response with your utility, or your local uh, or regional wholesale market for demand response or your energy enables uh, people to take advantage uh, and benefit from certain utility rates such as time of use or demand charge and so on. We really um, heavily rely on the IoT technology because we deploy you know, these systems and, and, and really uh, enable this uh, grid edge energy management and I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Luigi? data network uh, for what concerns cellular connectivity that customers can connect to enable 
a multitude of sensors and devices, which can also be used for. And I think uh, I, I think Luigi is breaking up somewhat. Network as well as including or all. Maybe we want to we want to come back to, to yeah. Benson and and Rula can or we want to come back to Luigi and Rula can provide him with a dial in. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's breaking up. It's breaking up. So uh, uh, Benson, maybe we can we okay. can push okay. forward to the next speaker and uh, you know Luigi can dial in. Yeah. Okay. I think Mike. Yeah, good day, everybody. This is Mike Ferry, and I'm the uh, CTO with Multitech. And at a glance, you know, Multitech is a, a manufacturer of, of IoT devices, IoT sensors, gateways. We're really focused on wireless technologies, including uh, being a founding member of the LoRaWAN Alliance or the LoRa Alliance. Um, so we use these core wireless technologies of, of LoRaWAN, uh, Bluetooth, public and private cellular technologies to enable sensors for wireless connectivity, to use uh, enable devices to be wirelessly connected over gateways. And, and usually in, in the pursuit of connected products and connected services with our customers. So in some cases, this could be distributed energy resources that need to be communicating with each other across the grid or across microgrids, as, uh, as Alex pointed out. Um, in other cases, it could be other kinds of connected assets that, uh, of, of course, we're on this quest to electrify everything um, you know, across all kinds of sectors and industries, um, but also you know, making more efficient use of those resources. So it, it's great if a fleet of vehicles, a, a truck or a service fleet, for example, uh, becomes electrified or moves to some sort of zero uh, carbon um, energy sources. But uh, there's also huge opportunities to... Um, to retrain how we use those resources using data from the field to say, let's let's not roll a truck. What if we could reduce the amount of um, activities that we have to do for these services by 20, 30% by bringing back data, as well as reduce the, uh, the energy footprint when we are putting those uh, assets into utilization. So in, in who we do this for, again, we typically are enabling connected products or connected services uh, for various OEMs and solutions providers. So whether that's converting a what would typically be a, a just a, a simple device that might have a high service cost out in the field, uh, turning that into a smart product or into a connected product such that they can reduce the amount of, of overhead of servicing that equipment, reduce, reduce the amount of hours uh, in the field, the amount of time on the road. Uh, and things like that, and really head towards this whole end-to-end -end solutions enablement and um, connected systems and, and systems of systems, which, uh, uh, you know, one example would be those connected microgrids that uh, that Alex had, uh, had discussed. Okay. Uh, let's see. No, let's get one. Okay, so thank you, Mike, uh, and it's attendant. I'll have you introduce yourself and your company. Okay, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, so, sounds good, thank you. Good, uh, good morning, uh, Benson, and everyone else that's with us today. Uh, again, thanks for having me on this panel to discuss this very important topic. Uh, again, my name is Jatenda Vora. I'm a Senior Director uh, of Carrier Relations at Telit, so I'm responsible for continuously uh, uh, keeping our technology roadmap aligned with all the uh, carriers. Um, I'm going to use this slide to introduce you to tell it, you know, by leveraging this IoT solutions ecosystem diagram. Uh, this was created by Beacham Research to show the IoT value chain. Um, it, it, it basically shows the first mile of IoT. Um, on the left-hand side, you have sensors, actuators, and devices that are sitting at the edge. Then on the right side, you have the other end of the IoT value chain where all, where all the applications in, uh, sit in the cloud. Then everything in between the device and the cloud are the various domains, such as the uh, so that's shown in the boxes, such as the edge hardware domain, the wide area domain, uh, the software cloud, and lastly the applications. So keep in mind, IoT is all about connectivity, the, uh, connecting the devices at the edge with the cloud application to exchange the data back and forth. So you may be wondering, uh, what is Telit's role in this ecosystem, or what is Telit doing to help our customers to connect their devices to their cloud applications? So bottom line is we created three main pillars for our offering 
to help our customers connect to their devices and bring all the data back to their cloud applications. So our first pillar is our module business. Uh, so we were born inside the wireless communication module space you know, over two decades ago. Then in time, we learned from our customers that whenever they need to send data, they need more than just the hardware modules. They need a cellular plan. So in order to help those customers, we became an IoT MVNO and opened up our second pillar, uh, which is our I IoT MVNO cellular connectivity business. You know, we did this because a large number of customers' biggest issue when it comes to connectivity is, de is deciding which mo mobile network to use. You know, how do you provision their device? How do they switch between networks if necessary? And then the third pillar of ours is a cloud platform. This is our remote management and data orchestration platform. You know, by data, I mean a connection to the devices, uh, monitoring the health of those devices, and also the sensor data. Our platform can help manage the data and also orchestrate the data into the cloud. So put it simply, just to kind of wrap this slide up, with the combination of our three pillars, the IoT, uh, cellular connectivity, our module business, and cloud, perform, uh, cloud platform, we want to enable IoT solutions to our customers and make it easy as possible for them to be successful in their digitization pro uh, projects. So with that, I'll move to the next slide here. Um, and basically I'm gonna use this slide, you know, so basically this diagram here was created by Accenture to kind of highlight the smart energy and utilities operations ecosystem. Um, I decided to show, it, show this to kind of frame up today's discussion on sustainability in the grid and the utility space. The bullets towards the left side of, of the slide uh, highlight the segments of the smart energy utilities ecosystem where IoT can help to improve sustainability and reduce energy consumption. So we at Telet are very active in many of these segments and that is the perspective I will provide to you today throughout this panel. Before I walk you through an example or two, I just wanted to highlight, Telet has, has a long history working on private network projects with utilities globally. We've been supporting private cellular deployments for utilities with smart metering projects in Europe since the early, early days of 450 megahertz. So I did not want to list too many examples of projects in this introductory section, mainly because we will be getting, that in, you know, getting into a deeper dive on that during the interactive panel discussion. But let me just briefly talk about one bullet, the second one, distribution hub, network diagnostics and preventive maintenance. You know, this is about remote monitoring tools for the distribution grid for all the substations. You know, tele customers such as multi-tech multi manufacture devices with our solutions, allowing utilities to keep an eye on the key parts of their distribution network. So on the distribution side of the advanced network diagnostics and preventive maintenance is where a lot of the waste and drain is detected and diagnosed as an example. So basically, you know what, I look forward to the discussion and I'll turn it back to Benson at this point. Okay. Thank you, Benson, Jacob, for that. Is, uh, Benson, should we should we check in with uh, Luigi to see if he's back with us? Luigi, can you hear us? May I can hear you. I don't know if you can hear me. You're coming through loud and clear. Right. Yeah. All so, right. Uh, Let's okay. start again, uh, Luigi. So, so, sorry for the hiccup, guys. No worries. Uh, yeah. So what what I was saying is I, I would I'll be very brief. So what what we do at Flow Live is building uh, a large and and um, hyper-local data network. With hyper-local, we mean that there is one single cloud with breakouts for cellular connection, as well as LTE 5G private networks, and also satellite providers for narrowband IoT, for example, that we are including. And this all converges in one cloud that we provide to our partners, and they can provide in this way, connectivity to a multitude of end users and, and, and you know, a huge amount of sensors and devices, which ultimately I use to deploy smart energy solutions, like for example, water metering and, and water leak detection, as well as smart lighting, which in turn reduces the energy consumption because lights on the streets can be managed much better. And other use cases, for example, you know, waste management or, or uh, vehicle telematics. So what we do is we enable devices to be connected to the network via cellular, via satellite, as well as via 5G private networks, all within one SKU. Okay. Did, uh, did you have another slide, uh, Luigi? Was that it? Okay, I think that was it. Okay. Yep. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, panelists, for introducing yourselves and your uh, companies. 
Uh, so let's go to the first question. Uh, and you know, Alex, I'm going uh, to start off with you first. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk and interest in, in sustainability. Right? Uh, you know, so for example, even in the U.S., uh, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act right, has a lot of money coming down from the federal government for studies of uh, green, green, uh, and climate action activities and initiatives. Right? Uh, but what's what's driving this interest? It's not just the U.S. It's around the world. Right? What's driving this? Interest? Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's it's all over the world. And I think it is really demonstrating that there are multiple trends underpinning this. This is not just one government initiative or, you know, one policy. Uh, you're absolutely right mentioning the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. It has a lot of amazing incentives for uh, the space uh, anywhere from tax credits to uh, direct subsidies to uh, a, a lot of uh, new um, kind of policy aspects. But I would probably um, list a few other trends as well. First of all, we are um, at the point uh, where the technology for um, you know energy sustainability, for clean energy generation, for energy storage, for transportation and EV charging and so on, all of these technologies uh, have crossed the chasm of, uh, you know, being kind of uh, in negative ROI, so so to speak. So put it plainly, it makes financial sense to deploy solar panels. It makes financial sense to deploy, you know, wind turbines and, and so on. And the industry um, at Broad has learned how to do this efficiently at scale. And of course, uh, an, another uh, a big topic is, uh, you know, the uh, that I mentioned is, you know, decarbonization. The global awareness of you know, climate change and some some of the uh, really international uh, incentives that uh, are, are pushed across multiple countries uh, are taking off, and uh, a, a lot of people make the the decision to transition towards, you know, for example, an electric vehicle. And we see this in, in numbers, right? This year was the first year in the U.S. when uh, 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 I think it was second quarter uh, when the sales of uh, new cars, uh, the, the EVs crossed the 5% mark, but which is considered as the uh, uh, kind of the tip point, right? The, after that, the acceleration becomes exponential. So all of that uh, brings again it, it, it's almost like a perfect storm in a good way uh, that underpins this interest in sustainability that underpins the interest in developing both our grids uh, our infrastructure but also the grid edge in microgrid technology uh, uh, various technologies in 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 move towards uh, more sustainable and renewable uh, energy. And then, of course, uh, uh, we should not forget the ongoing crisis, the energy cri crisis that impacts fossil fuel market, uh, whether it's oil or natural gas internationally. And I'm sure that a lot of uh, countries and governments are looking at this and thinking, OK, can I really depend on external uh, fossil fuel supply? Can my economy uh, depend on that? Is is this really the, the way we want to go is this too risky is this too expensive uh, down the road whether just from price perspective or you know from strategic perspective and uh the the beauty of clean energy uh among other things of course is that it can be generated locally you can generate electricity you know if, if we're talking about you know somebody's home it, it, it's right there but you can also generate it locally on the you know neighborhood side uh, a scale or a city scale or you know some county or state scale, in in that removes the dependency on you know some some other third actors that may or may not act reasonably and logically. So these are I think all the uh, just maybe even I, I missed a few and I'm sure you know uh, my colleagues here will. Uh, add more, but these are some of the factors that go into this interest. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to open it up to the other panelists. Uh, if there are any thoughts on, on this topic, on this question. 
Yeah, Vincent, uh, one thing I would add is, you know, if, uh, of course, all these uh, companies have, uh, you know, sustainability and ESG, um, you know, goals and objectives, but also, the, you know, the financial interests are, are very well aligned because generally speaking, as, you know, sustainability and efficiency and effectiveness are really highly correlated. So as you make better use of your assets, better use of your resources, at the same time, you're you're lowering your consumption of natural resources and you're reducing your waste. So it just it drives a lot of financial alignment as well. And, and uh, you know, those factors come together along with the, the technologies that we're seeing uh, to help drive this from a you know, carbon neutral uh, uh, perspective. So, so I think we're seeing in the commercial space a lot of really well aligned uh, interests um, behind all these th this movement. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, what role does IoT play uh, in helping drive sustainability? I, I, you know, based on, I know you guys all worked on various projects across the board, uh, but what are some of the uh, examples of projects that you've come across in, in your work? And, you know, Alex, maybe I'll start with you again, and then uh, we'll let the panel answer this, this question. Thank you. Um, you know, really, you cannot under, or sorry, you cannot overestimate the role of IoT here, and it is, um, it is quite unique and new. Um, this is this is very different from, you know, when, when we think about energy and grid management. Um, naturally, you know, historically, uh, utility companies and grid operators have relied on certain technologies. For example, AMI or advanced metering infrastructure, smart meters. Um, and, and typically, right, these were technologies uh, that were proprietary, uh, which means they were not using, you know, the common kind of uh, people internet, they would use proprietary mesh networks that would be deployed and supported by certain companies and utilities, um, whatnot. And at the age where you really need to get um, deep insights into the end users of electricity into the distributed generation and a lot of, um, I mean, really, I, I know this this may sound like a, a buzzword, but we're talking about uh, am amounts of data that do represent the big data. This, this is, you know, we're talking about the amounts of data that have to be captured and transferred and stored uh, at a scale that, you know, the energy industry has not really seen before. And, and, and then, of course, the other side of the equation is control. So, um, you know, not only capturing the data, but acting upon it. All of this is enabled by IoT. Um, you know, uh, I think today uh, we already touched on uh, connectivity uh, or communication. So all of these sensors and, you know, controlling uh, uh, hardware devices have to be connected and have to be connected in real time. Um, in, in this is again, as I said, very different from what the industry has seen, um, you know, uh, up till now. Because if you if you're talking about smart meters, for example, which is probably the closest thing to IoT in uh, in the kind of energy or utility world, we are talking about uh, you know 15 minute uh, increments. That's the typical standard interval how uh, smart meters operate. Right, they collect data every 15 minutes. Now, with you know your traditional uh, IoT, right, and, and I can uh, speak for Lumen here, we're talking about thousands of measurements per second. This is the data that cannot be handled by the existing networks. This is where IoT, internet, cloud technologies are really coming into play in providing a lot of benefit to the grid. Um, I, I think we'll, I hope we can touch on this later today. There's of course the other side of this coin, which is how reliable and secure these technologies are, and what can and should be done to uh, make them, you know, let's call it utility grade, because we're talking about critical infrastructure here, which has to be, you know, very secure and reliable, of course. But um, that's, you know, IoT really, uh, you know, moves this industry forward. And um, one more piece, you know, uh, and I promise I will shut up. Uh, one more piece is um, 
it's not just the um, you know local to cloud kind of IoT connectivity. We're also talking about um, multiple appliances, multiple endpoints being able to talk to each other, sometimes bypassing the cloud. That's another form or flavor of IoT, right? It's not local to cloud to local, it's local to local, because that enables speed, that enables additional security in some cases, and that does cater to certain use cases in the industry, such as, for example, grid outages and internet outages, where you still need to have you know, the smart, con con controllable, manageable grid edge, but you may not have the internet connectivity in some cases, but you still need that uh, system to operate and then it has to be uh, locally operated and connected locally. So that's that's obviously another use case. Okay. Great. Uh, Richard Tender, uh, you can yeah. also answer that question. Yeah, so thanks, Benson. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I actually believe IoT will be a game changer for sustainability. You know, with IoT, you create a network of connected smart things that will make humankind more productive than ever. So as more and more of these devices go from dumb to smart, they'll share data with each other seamlessly and then use machine learning to modify that data in real time. And these modifications will make processes uh, run faster, you know, achieve uh, efficiencies and also achieve savings. Uh, last but definitely not least, it, it's going to be better for the environment as well. And we at tell it, you know, just to name a couple of examples of projects that work, work, work uh, that I came across is one is wastewater management. So we have customers using our products, you know, and for example, they're using our modules, connectivity and platform to help them leverage IoT to not waste water, which is a very precious resource, especially you know many places around the world. So we're, we're helping customers ensure accurate measurement and reporting wastewater death rates aligned with flow rates. And that's just one example of a project. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, yeah, I guess, uh, well, uh, sure, Mike or Luigi. Yeah, in general, Benson, if if I can add uh, one one thing, I think in general IoT helps in reducing, you no, know, enabling us to have a lot of data, which ultimately allow us allow companies to reduce, you know, reduce the amount of electricity used in smart lighting, reduce the amount of water because you can detect the leak much earlier than before, reduce the fuel your you know uh, waste collection truck needs because you can optimize the route. So I think reduce reduction is an important word when it comes to IoT in sustainability. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a that's a great, great point. That's a great point. Uh, let's see, so let me go to the next question. And and this is kind of tied to a question that's that come in from the audience as well. Uh, but you know, what are some of the key technologies to enable the IoT for sustainability? I heard a couple of things. I heard data, I heard connectivity, right? And I heard, uh, a few other things here. So, yeah, uh, maybe Mike, I'll start with you uh, on, on that one. Yeah, it's a, there's really a whole collection of technologies. So, so certainly sensors, right? And then along with sensors comes edge compute, um, and then also cloud models, uh, um, whether it's edge to edge or edge to cloud and hybrid cloud models. Uh, certainly, we're seeing machine learning take a bigger and bigger role all the time. And then, kind of holding all this together as we want to move all this data around, it's really uh, important that how much our wireless technologies have advanced in the last, um, you know, last decade, really. Um, so things have really settled out um, in terms of um, using cellular, public, public and private cellular, whether it's 4G, 5G, um, using uh, wireless sensing technologies like LoRaWAN. Uh, certainly, you know, Wi-Fi is in use, but not so much IoT. Uh, you, know, you see Wi-Fi a lot in consumer IoT and obviously in, in business machine type devices. Um, but not so much an IoT type technology. So, you know, we, but we have this nice spread of wireless technologies now, then you choose that based on how much bandwidth do you need, how much latency do you need, what sort of power access do you have? Um, so, but we really have a, a, a whole a set of standards now to, to support all these IoT applications. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, ben, 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 well, I just wanted to add one, if I can. Um, mm -hmm. but I think what Mike uh, listed, you know, from a cellular perspective, lots of great, great uh, you know, uh, uh, examples he gave. But, but when I think specifically about a key technology that will enable IoT for sustainability, one, one other, another good one is new SIM technologies. For example, you know, Tele has been a pioneer at introducing a software-only SIM that we call SimWise to the market, you know, back in 2017. 
And this product does two things. One is it reduces the amount of plastic produced in the industry. And number two, at some point it reduces the amount of plastic that will get that will get wasted and recycled. So this has become a trend now. And so now there's more new SIM te technologies that don't require a plastic card, but will support the iSIM in the exact same chip you use for your cellular communication. So that's uh, an, another example of a technology. Um, Benson, I'll, I would like to add, um, maybe this is kind of the next layer on top of, you know, the traditional if you will, you know, communication technologies, whatnot. But something we're definitely seeing in the field is that um, there are a lot of standards and protocols out there that are being used across the industry, even you know, uh, at a kind of you know local home level, right? Uh, when, when you have multiple devices, y you're looking at a wild set of things, anywhere from. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth to more specific things like, you know, Modbus protocols, even sometimes CAN bus protocols and, 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 and a few others. And what uh, is very important down the road is that we have the ability to interconnect and communicate across different devices, um, kind of using some, um, some, some sort of, you know, standard. And of course there's, um, there, there's, uh, in, you know, especially in a smart home kind of space, there's a lot of buzz about the new standard called Matter, which I'm sure folks have heard of. Um, and whether or not that's the, you know, technology, I, I guess is yet to be seen, but definitely kind of creating some sort of unification layer is absolutely critical for successful adoption of IoT in, uh, you know, sustainability in the energy space. Yeah, I think uh, that's a, that's a key key thing you brought up right? interoperability. I think that's a major gap right? in in uh, IoT today. Uh, in fact, that's uh, one of researchers finding out that across all industries, not just the energy and utilities industry, but uh, interoperability is one of the major major uh, barriers uh, today. Uh, I want to uh, you know I'm looking at the audience question. There's a, a question that came in. Uh, and maybe it was partially answered, but uh, since we're on this topic, what forms of IoT connectivity do you see in use today and what's coming? Right? So, for example, LTE, NB-IoT, 5G, Wi-Fi, or LoRaWAN. Uh, you know, Mike uh, or uh, Jatender, you may, or, or Luigi, let's, let's start with you on, on that one. Yeah, so definitely Narubana IoT, LTM um, are are by now a standard used in, in many, many scenarios from, from smart metering to, to asset tracking and, and also smart lighting. But we also see uh, new cases coming up with 5G, especially in the US, actually, in North America. Many, many new opportunities uh, for 5G use cases, which enable to do new things, to do more rapid things, to do a better smart grid management because the latency is way lower than what we're used, um, you know, since since today. So um, narrowband, CATM1, uh, a de facto technology uh, used in many applications and really helping to deploy a lot of sensors that can run for a long time with battery, uh, while 5G is enabling situations and, and solutions that require lower latencies and a lot more data to be exchanged. So this is this is the difference and this is how these technologies are helping uh, also sustainability. Yes, yeah, so I, th I thought Mike kind of touched upon this, but you know, obviously there's no one technology that fits all, you know, it, it could be LPWA, CAT1, CAT4, but the selection of the technology really depends on the use case and requirements of the application. Uh, but regardless of the technology, I guess the intention is to connect things and make them remotely monitored, right? That's really what, what everyone's trying to achieve. Yeah, and I'd add there's a, a regional flair to that as well. So certainly at a technology space, like I said earlier, you have to start with how much bandwidth do I need, how much latency do I need, um, and, and how much power do I have available? You, you certainly can't battery power a, a 5G uh, installation, for example, with a small long life battery. The, the other side is, is that network available in my area? Um, am I going with a public network where I ex expect to work with a, a carrier 
Um, you know, for example, if you wanted to deploy uh, a narrow band IoT here in the US, uh, very limited in where you could deploy that with various carriers. Uh, you know, CAD M, a little less limited, but it's also very regional. So you have to have the ability to fail over um, from your maybe CAD M connection to a, a CAT 4 or CAT 6 because it doesn't have a CAD M supported everywhere nationwide, versus some areas in Asia have very broad uh, narrow band IoT coverage, for example. So, so a lot of times you have to, you also have to make a decision, is this gonna be on a public network? Am I I'm gonna lease this network from somebody else? And if so, what's available in my target area? Or is it gonna be a private network where I say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a responsibility for managing that network myself and whether I deploy my own LoRaWAN or I, I, I deploy my own private, uh, private LTE or private 5G connection even. So yeah, a lot of factors that go in there, but uh, you know, really to answer the audience question, it's, it is all of the above. It's, there's not a one size fits all uh, here. It all depends on a number of factors. Yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, that's an interesting and great answer. You know, we uh, did some work with utilities and one of the, the big concerns for them, uh, especially for IoT is really about uh, around security, right? So they said, you know, for some of the uh, other connectivity methods, they don't feel that it's secure enough uh, and so that was for them, um, uh, the, you know, the grid was mission critical, right? And they can't afford to take any kind of hits. So as you look at some of these these uh, solutions that you're developing for solutions, uh, you know, the security, the, the connectivity method is is uh, uh, also very important, uh, especially in issues that uh, from like a resilience perspective, like fault tolerance and resilience. So that's a, a major, major area that, we, that we've been seeing and hearing about as well. Uh, let me go to the, uh, another question. Um, what are some of the challenges and opportunities for IoT and sustainability? And, you know, I think you touched upon where your company plays a role, but, you know, maybe uh, what are those ch opportunities? Let's just say challenges and opportunities. So, uh, Jitendra, I'll start with you. Yeah, thanks, Benson. Yeah, I guess from our position in the X system, uh, one of the big challenges has to do with the slow moving market. You know, that's very conservative and risk adverse and, and strongly regulated. Uh, therefore, it's not easy to get new technologies approved. It's not easy to quickly roll out new technologies. And with that challenge, I, I actually see a lot of opportunities. Um, you know, I see opportunity to help the environment with sustainability. I see an opportunity to help the bottom line in terms of reduced costs, in, in terms of increased effic efficiency and greater productivity. An opportunity to enable new segments uh, into the utility space, such as EV charging. You know, five years ago, for example, EV charging was barely talked about, and now it's one of the most ra rapid growing industries. You know, this is just one example of a new opportunity, but there's many more. And lastly, I just want to say from a new opportunity, I think adopting IoT for sustainability is becoming a huge new opportunity because of, of all the importance that's received from, you know, the young generation uh, and, the, and the really skilled people. A lot of these people are, are starting to say they're being very selective on which company they want to work for. You know, some of them only want to work for companies that believe in these causes. Um, so I think that that's also an opportunity uh, from that perspective. Right. Mike, Luigi, or Alex, uh, feel free to chime in. Yeah. One, one thing I would add is, um, so we work with companies all the time, helping them enable these connected products, connected services. And, and certainly there's, um, we a lot of times focus on the technology challenges and, and the integration of the technology. And th those are real challenges, but they are getting better and easier as all these technologies mature and our engineering tools and skill sets are kind of catching up with all the cloud-based computing that goes along with this. But the, the side we don't talk a lot about is, is the business process changes that have to come along. So, you know, if you're a company that's trying to manage a lot of remote assets and, and possibly a lot of remote field staff and, and service staff along with that, just getting you all this data from those remote assets, that in itself doesn't save you any money. And, you know, the, the, the savings doesn't come in, you know, the sustainability improvements don't come in until you adapt your business processes driven by that data. Um, so we, we see that being, um, you know, one of the things that slows company adoption down quite a bit is they, they can prove an ROI and a proof of concept, but for that to really roll out in an organization, they have to change their business practices and business processes to go along with that. And, and that, that can be a harder, uh, harder journey for many, uh, many companies than the technology itself. Yeah, I totally agree with Mike. It's very, very often, you know, the, the how to use the data is even more important sometimes to how to get the data. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I will um, 
I'll probably put on um, the end user hat on, uh, which, which is, you know, uh, a person who consumes electricity. And, and really, there is a, a very, I think it's a challenging opportunity there. That is, we are all very much accustomed to, um, you know, electricity consumption that is nearly unlimited. We just get home, flip the switch, light comes on. We plug something into mm -hmm. our you know wall plug and and it works right. It you know, powers or you know whatever emits light or heats, whatnot. And really, the 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 challenge here is that with the energy transition, with the electrification of everything, with the adoption of IoT in 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 management of the grid, our homes are going to be much more interactive and dynamic in the way they're using energy. So let me give you this example in, um, I think, um, you know, EV charging was just mentioned. We know today that there is no chance the grid as it is can cater to uh, a substantial percentage of cars that are switched to EVs. Put it differently, if everyone were to replace their car with an EV, the grid by no means is capable of providing all that electricity to charge all, all those cars. And by the way, that like that 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 point is not at a hundred percent. Like it's not that we all have to switch till that collapse happens. Like it's actually a fairly small number. And, and really what that means is that your home EV charging or any other EV charging, maybe you're charging at work or elsewhere, will be somewhat dynamic. Like you may be able to charge only within certain hours or at different price or at, you know, uh, on demand or you, like there are all these different use cases and there's a challenge of educating and changing the current habits, how people um, consume electricity. And at the same time, obviously you want to make that seamless. So really the big opportunity is in solving this, this problem. Like how do you make it subtle how do you make it um, uh, kind of less, you know, how do you create less impact on the user's day-to-day -day life and at the same time provide all this value and enable sustainability, enable decarbonization and all, all, all other things. That's uh, that's gonna be really an interesting uh, uh, problem to solve over the next really, you know, couple of years. Thank you for, uh, for that. Um, I see it's just like to remind the audience if you have any questions, feel, uh, please feel free to type it in the chat box. We have a couple more minutes here. Uh, so I'm going to, I guess, uh, just ask one more question. Uh, you know, what, what are some of your best practices and lessons learned in doing IoT for sustainability? And I'll just open it up to the panel. Yeah, one, uh, one thing I've observed working with our companies, our, our partner companies, is, is one thing is they really need to treat this. This isn't an event, right? It's it's a journey. Um, so it, it's it's a continuous improvement process and it starts with having the right metrics um, and then, you know, just a continuous improvement around how do we drive that metric to the right right end game. So if you start with the wrong metric or if you start with the idea that, look, this this is a project and it has a start and an end date and then we're, we're done, right? We're done with our digital transformation. We're done with our sustainability program. Um, you know, that that's just not the right mindset to go into. So, and then you know, taking the time to map the business process changes that need to happen to go along with these, the, the new data that the technology is going to bring you. Uh, and, and then on top of that, you know, choose your partners, decide which of these pieces are our core expertise inside the company and which pieces you need to reach outside to help, you know, help avoid all those pitfalls that uh, as you, you tackle a lot of these new, new technologies. <laughs> I would uh, probably touch on some of the you know lessons learned in in new best practices as it relates to uh, this you know tricky thing called supply chain in IoT. Uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people on, on the call today are well aware of you know the ongoing crisis that's uh, that's you know our supply chain, especially such an important component of it, you know, for any IoT enabled, you know, uh, technology, which is microchips. 
I mean, there are different flavors of that microprocessors, microcontrollers, sensors, whatnot. But um, today, the engineering and development of new products and technologies looks very different from the supply chain perspective where you know a couple maybe three years ago when you would build something you just you know pick what what suits best your product and and you assume it's there right you assume it's available today you have to be designing with availability in mind you need to be locking uh, certain, you know, technologies, certain supply chains up front. You need to be very thoughtful on the volumes, the timing, the lead times, the pricing, of course. And also, you need to be thoughtful about the ability to interchange. Oh, I cannot get this, you know, flavor of, uh, uh, you know, a communications chip. Maybe I can switch to another. Maybe my software is capable of doing that. Like, there are all these you know, new best practices that go into development, which um, really are, are extremely important in the world we live in. Okay. Thank you. Uh, to Tender or Luigi, do you want to uh, answer sure. this? Uh, one, one thing I... Oh, sorry, Jitender, go on. No, go ahead, you go ahead. Well, Luigi. I'll go, I'll All go right. Go no, one thing I... I wanted to add on top of what Alex said is um, today how we plan and design completely changed. But um, one thing that we've learned in the past few years is that sometimes no. companies think that we usually suggest is try to um, lean on companies that you know already did it uh, on solutions that are already in the market because as as mike said before very often it's not really about how how do i get that data is how does my business process change as a result of getting the data no? so i think uh, a suggestion to whoever is starting an iot project is focus on not only on the technical part but but also on the business part and see whether there's already a solution out there can that can help on on the technical part That was in Japan, so please go on. Yeah, so just really quick. So I think from our experience working, you know, working on large projects, you know, we've observed customers would just deploy, you know, end device with a module in it. But, you know, after observing this, you know, we highly recommend our customers to put in place from the beginning the right tools to be able to remotely monitor their products at any given time so they can immediately detect odd behaviors, you know, when if and when that happens. So that's one of the things that we, uh, you know, recommend. And they can also, you know, fix problems with firmware or their, uh, F, you know, firmware over the air upgrades and things of that nature. So we uh, recommend that from, from out the gate to our customers so they can kind of be better prepared. Thank you. Thank you, Jitendra. Uh, so I think we're almost up at the, at the top of the hour. Uh, yeah, I guess panelists, uh, if you uh, have take 30 seconds, uh, you guess, uh, share any, any last thoughts, any uh, words of wisdom. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start if you don't sure. mind. Uh, I'm, I'm just super excited about the times we're living in. We're looking at a major shift in, uh, you know, how we consume, generate, store, you know, transmit, distribute electricity uh, across the world. And this is really exciting because we're building a better world and IoT enables this transition alongside with, you know, the, obviously just some other technologies such as, you know, PV and storage, whatnot. So it's it's an amazing time to be in and i um, really thankful for everyone to join, to joining this call and learning about it. Yeah, I'd just I like to, ah, sorry, go on. Oh no, go right ahead. No, I just wanted to to finish with with reiterating something I said before. So, in my opinion, the exciting thing in in IoT for sustainability is we should all think how can IoT help us in reducing our consumption in general. That's what I have in mind. That's I think what we should all focus on. 
If, if I can just really quickly say, yeah, so I mean, from my perspective, you know, we're really happy to be in the forefront of this new business for utilities and, you know, uh, together with our ecosystem partners that are on this panel uh, to support the customers in their digitization uh, trans transformation with our products and solutions. And, you know, we'll be happy to help address any questions anyone may have. Yeah, and I would just, you know, echo everybody's sentiments there. It's a really exciting time and it, it goes beyond um, just, you know, electrical grids and, and electrifying everything. We're talking about all kinds of uh, infrastructure here, whether it's public and private transportation infrastructure, uh, you know, use of natural resources like water, irrigation and agriculture. The, the technologies are coming together and the cost points and, and deployability of those technologies to really be impactful. And we're, we've come out of a almost a decade of seeing lots of proof of concepts, but not so many things move into high, high production to things are really starting to move. Uh, and I know myself and all the panelists feel it now. These, these solutions are starting to move very, very quickly now. So it is very exciting times. Okay, thank you everyone for, uh, for your words of wisdom and some of the insights that you share. Uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to Keith and I think Keith, uh, close it up. Yeah, well, hey. Uh, thanks to everybody, uh, especially our panelists and you, Benson. But uh, thanks to everybody in the audience as well uh, for joining us. Uh, really interesting stuff. I certainly learned a lot. And uh, we, we've got more coming. So uh, uh, as we stated earlier uh, in the track, uh, we'll be doing IoT Week at CES in Las Vegas uh, in early January. And then later in the month, on the 18th, we'll be doing sort of a CES wrap up uh, where we'll be talking about things that we s saw at the show. Uh, so please join us for those events. Uh, you can register online at any time at uh, www.iotm2mcouncil.org. And uh, hey, thanks everyone for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody.